just open in prayer. Well, Heavenly Father, we come again, Lord, to look tonight at this teaching, Father, that we're trusting will be informative. We're trusting, Lord, would really minister to our hearts, Lord. We're trusting, Father, that we would have our understanding enlarged. We know, Lord, that we can't retain everything. But I pray, Father, there would be some things that we could retain tonight, Lord. And our heart's desire and our burden, Father, is that we might be able to reach out to those that are caught, Lord, in this cult, Father, that we might be able to reach out to them with the gospel of Jesus Christ and that, Father, lives could be changed and touched. We know that many in the lodge ignorantly are there, Lord, and are not aware, Father, of the true essence of Freemasonry. But I pray, God, that through this teaching, over the course of the weeks, and as we bring it finally to a close, that there would be much needed information that would be presented and that people's lives could be touched, changed by the truth that they would hear. I pray, God, help us, Lord, to be stewards in these last days, Father. We know that that devil just roams around seeking, Father, whom he might devour. And we know, Lord, that he knows his days are short and numbered. And so in these last days he goes about with great fury, Lord. But we're also mindful that he appears as an angel of light to deceive, Father, those who have no foundation on which they stand. I thank you for the word of God. I thank you for Jesus Christ. For as that great hymn says, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. And Lord, we can testify tonight that we have a foundation. The word of God in which we can trust 100%. We thank you for this, Lord. For it indeed is an anchor to keep us in these wayward times. And a light, Lord, to lead us. O oh, Father, I pray tonight for your great grace upon my life as my brother prayed we're not ignorant of satan's devices we know that in even just teaching this topic lord we are treading father into the enemy's grounds but we ask that again that you would cover us with thy protection indeed that the blood of jesus christ would cover us at this hour now lord and help us keep my mind Keep my thoughts clear, Lord. Grant my lips that I might not err. And so I give this whole time into your hands now. And thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. And so we come again today into the teaching to have a look at Freemasonry and it's part one, part 28 in the series on the cults and my desire today really is just to lay a foundation in looking at what Freemasonry really is. We're going to go on from here, I mean we will touch on it on this week also but we're going to go on to really lift the, can of, lift the lid off the can of worms as it were and to really see what's at the core of this secretive fraternal order and I'll tell you what if there's anything, you know, in all the cults that I've studied, this is like a can of worms. You know, it is almost like worms that burrow under the ground and you have to dig to try to just find out what's really there. Because on the surface, it seems so innocent, so nice and so, you know, inviting. But as you begin to research and look into it, and more importantly, when we hold it compared to the word of God, we see that there's much more than meets the eye. When one thinks of Freemasonry, what thoughts immediately spring to our mind? Are they positive or are they negative? For some, they think of charitable works, good citizens of society, morally upstanding individuals. For others, thoughts are conjured of a good old boys club. You know, you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. 
For others still, they think on a more sinister level and see their conspiracy, corruption, perjury. A secret society, and some would even say worshippers of Lucifer. Now I want to be clear from the very start, before we go on any further, that it's not my aim to delve into the many fruitless conspiracies that are out there. I mean, they abound. You know, the hot topic of the day. I mean, me being a school teacher, the children are always talking about Freemasonry and Jay-Z and Rihanna and, you know, all of this talk. We're not dealing with conspiracy theories today. But rather what we're going to try to do is deal with fact. You know, because if you ask the average person that's propounding these theories, what is Freemasonry? They'll say, oh, it's devil worshipping. You know, it's Illuminati trying to take over the world. But, you know, they are not very informed on what Freemasonry really is at its root. And so, more specifically, my aim in this teaching, throughout the whole teaching, is to answer one very important question relevant to the teaching to do with the cults. And it's namely this. Is Freemasonry compatible with Christianity? That's the number one thing that I want to try to get from this teaching. Is Freemasonry compatible with Christianity? And it's the question that we're going to place central to this study. Everything we're going to explore, everything we're going to examine through the course of this teaching will point to this central and fundamental question. Now you might say, what's the need for such a teaching? Why bother? You know, surely, what has this got to do with Christianity? Well, the answer that I give is simple. Many professing Christian, Christians, both historically and in the present, are Freemasons. Many practicing quote-unquote Christians are Freemasons. And they have no problem in one hand claiming to be a Christian and in the other claiming to be a Freemason. And so my heart as I bring it home to the body of Christ is that if we are, you know, if anyone is even listening who, who is a Christian and would say they're a Christian and at the same time a Freemason, this is the question we want to explore. Indeed, many believe that Freemasonry is absolutely compatible with Christianity. They would say there's absolutely no contradiction. And they would rather even more than that say that rather than hindering their Christianity or their ability to be good Christians, they would actually say it enhances it. Now, masonry is also known as Freemasonry. Masonry, we'll use that quite a lot throughout the course just for short. It's the same thing. And it's a very powerful secret society that traces its modern origins to the early 18th century when the first Grand Lodge was formed in London, England in the year 1717. So it's very, very old. Its ancient roots, however, can be traced back many thousands of years to the ancient mystery religions of Egypt, of Rome and of Greece. You see much of it in their symbology, much of it in their symbology. Well, like the ancient mystery religions of old, Freemasonry, and catch this, is esoteric in nature. What does esoteric mean? It means simply that it conceals its teachings <coughs> um, from the uninitiated and reveals them to those initiates with proper knowledge. So we want to understand what the Bible un means. Obviously, we understand as Christians when we're born again of God's Spirit, there's certain... Um, grace that is given to us to understand some of the mysteries but on face value we can open the bible you know and we can actually read it and it makes sense you know there's a whole literary component to it it reads like english we can understand it's not hidden away in some vault you know we can go to the local christian bookshop and buy one now freemasons say we're not a secret society but the issue is this the average person cannot understand the teachings of freemasonry only the initiates those who are in the know and so in that sense it most certainly is a secret society one cannot go onto um, their homepage and find out what they teach you know they'll give you an outline uh, a sort of front to the public but you can't know what's really there behind the scenes and we'll go into that more as we continue through this now the major way that they accomplish this freemasonry is that they major on the use of symbolism symbolism they major on the use of allegories and also on oaths and rituals and in that sense they conceal from the world what they're really about but reveal it to the to the initiates 
I want to talk about the structure of the lodge before we continue because it's quite important. You know, just as a sidestep, we're going to try and have a little bit of foundation and understand a little bit about it. And this is common knowledge. You know, we can go online and we can find this in the public domain. There's nothing secretive about this. Well, unlike the majority of cults, Freemasonry does not have a single worldwide central authority from which it draws all its truths and practices and which it's accountable and answerable to. It doesn't. So we know for the Jehovah's Witness, Brooklyn, New York, it's the Watchtower. You know, for the Seventh-day Adventist, it's the headquarters, the General Council. We know for the Mormons, Utah City, you know, and obviously the headquarters there um, of, of Mormonism. Freemasonry is not like that. There's no central place where all Freemasons gain their teachings from. Rather, the highest authority in Masonry is the independent and sovereign Grand Lodge which governs a given country or a given state in America because we know, I think it's 50 states and so there's 50 Grand Lodges that govern each of those states. For the UK, England and Wales at least, there's a central body. For Scotland there's one, for Ireland there's one. And any connection then between jurisdictions is done solely on a mutual recognition, you know, mutual recognition. And for this reason, rituals may differ from one jurisdiction to another. One united Grand Lodge might have a certain slightly bit of a ritual in, in, a, per, in a specific degree, then another lodge, slightly different. The leader of a Grand Lodge is called the Grand Master. You know, the leader of a Grand Lodge is called the Grand Master. And the Grand Master of Freemasonry in England is none other than Prince Edward, the Duke of Kent, cousin to Queen Elizabeth II and grandson of King George the fifth, so he shares the same granddad as Queen Elizabeth II. The Duke of Kent is the longest serving Grand Master of the United Grand Lodge of England. The United Grand Lodge of England, an office that is held since, six, since 1967. He's held this office for nearly 50 years. Now, the United Grand Lodge of England, or Uggle for short, is the governing body for some a quarter of a million Freemasons in England. Worldwide, there are approximately 6 million Freemasons active in over 160 different countries around the world. The United States has the largest number of Freemasons, um, totaling some 2 million members. But Britain, for its size, you know, is right up there at the top, right up there for the top. If you consider the landmass, you know, and the population of the country, you know, a quarter of a million or so are uh, um, Freemasons in England, whereas two million in America, look how big America is. That said, as well, it's England that lays claim to being the official birthplace and the home of modern Freemasonry. In 1717, four London lodges assembled together to form the first Grand Lodge in the world. The United Grand Lodge of England, and there it is in London, and that's their coat of arms. Today, all Masonic Grand Lodges in the world trace their origins to this first Grand Lodge which has the single largest membership of any Grand Lodge in the world. And so remember what I was saying about population size. If you think in America, the deal, each state has a Grand Lodge. England and Wales has one. And as I've just read, that they have um, the largest single membership of any Grand Lodge in the world. Intermediate authorities... Um, called Provincial Grand Lodges operate underneath the Grand Lodge. In England, it corresponds to the historic counties. So Wolverhampton, where, where we live, would come under the jurisdiction of, or the district of Staffordshire, Staffordshire. And Wolverhampton actually is or contains the Provincial Grand Lodge for that borough of Staffordshire. And it's along the Technal Road. You know, it's along the Techno Lodge. That is the provincial Grand Lodge of the whole of Staffordshire. And Freemasons meet as a lodge 
and usually share the same lodge building. So if you're a Freemason, a bit like in the army, you'd belong to a, a battalion or something. You know, in Freemason, you belong, belong to a lodge, and the lodge are the group of people that would meet in a lodge, if you know what I mean. And why do I say that? Well, because one Freemason hall could actually be the lodge of many groups, many different lodges within Freemasonry. So no less than 13 lodges meet at the Wolverhampton Masonic Hall. No less than 13 different lodges share the same building. Obviously they meet at alternating times, but there you go. England has some 8,000 lodges, 100 of which are located in the Staffordshire province. So that actually covers Stoke-on-Trent and it's quite a large area when you actually look so draw it from the old historic um, boundaries rather than the modern ones now the highest authority in each lodge is a man by the name of a worshipful master and he exercises full vested power over the lodge and presides over all ritual and ceremonies he's the worshipful master now, i want to talk a bit about masonic degrees and bodies a little bit about the structure craft lodges in england and if you're in America, it's called Blue Lodges, refers to lodges that are responsible for conferring the first three degrees of masonry. And so the true heart of masonry is found in the first three degrees. First degree is the entered apprentice, the second degree, the fellow craft degree, and finally, the third degree, which is sort of the crowning degree, is the master mason. And that constitutes craft masonry, Ogle, or the United Grand Lodge of England, presides over um, this craft masonry, as it's called. Now, each degree that one enters into is through a special ceremony, and of course, along with that comes the ritual. Can't stress it enough that central to Freemasonry is its ritual, is its ritual, and I'll go on to show you more or speak more about that shortly. And those rituals consist of oaths, it consists of secret passwords, signs, handshakes, dramas and lectures. And when one arrives at the third degree of a master mason, so he begins as an entered apprentice, he is initiated into masonry, he then goes on to the fellow craft, he then goes on to the master mason degree. At that point, once he's been initiated as a master mason, he's then entitled to the full privileges of masonry, including the privilege of being able to visit any lodge, so he can be a guest at any um, Masonic lodge, obviously within the jurisdiction of the United Grand Lodge, you know, within England and Wales, but I'm guessing it would apply to Scotland and Ireland upon consent, he'd have, he'd have to obviously negotiate that. But many Freemasons, once they've arrived at the Master Mason degree, are actually quite happy to stay there. They don't move any further within Masonry. I believe my granddad was um, a Master Mason, and as far as I know, he left it there. You know, and many, many do. I think it's about 80%, you know, when I was having a look at it, actually remain at that place. And approximately 20% at that point are eligible to pursue Freemasonry further if they so wish. And what does that mean? Well, it means that they move out of the jurisdiction of Ugal, the United Grand Lodge, and they begin to move into what we call appendant bodies. And what that means is they're attached to Freemasonry, but not under the direct governance of the United Grand Lodge of that country. Now, as I said, these appendant bodies require that a candidate be a master mason and he must be in good standing with his lodge if he wants to join these other bodies, these other masonic bodies. In Britain, unlike the US, separate bodies administer each order in, in our country. In England and Wales, the only degree that's formally recognised after, after the craft masonry, the master degree, is actually the degree of Holy Royal Arch, the Holy Royal Arch degree. That is recognised by the United Grand Lodge. All the other degrees are acknowledged, but they're not given that official recognition of Ogo. Now, members of the Holy Royal Arch, it's an ancient and a prestigious degree, this, this degree is, and they meet in Royal Arch chapters which are attached to a craft lodge. So at Wolverhampton Masonic Hall, 
You'll have your regular lodges that meet, but within that you'll have a Royal Arch chapter. Maybe two, I think. The, when I had a look into it, there was two Royal Arch chapters, I believe, that meet in the Masonic Hall. And they would have separate meetings, and they would be Royal Arch Masons that meet there. As I said, it's, a, it's an order that's recognised by Ogle. Other Masonic appendant bodies that aren't recognised, but as I said, they're acknowledged, include the Order of Mark Master Masons. And at this point, at Master Mason point, you can branch off in either way. You can go the route, as you can see on the screen, of the Order of the Holy Royal Arch, and from there it leads into other pathways, the Knights Templar, the Order of the Knights Templar. But you can also go right onto the Order of Mark Master Masons, the Order of the Secret Monitor, and on the end there, Ancient and Accepted Rite. And we'll talk a little bit about more about that. So you can see there's different pathways, different pathways one can choose. As I said, if one chooses to pursue the path of the Holy Royal Arch Order, you can progress further via other appendant bodies, such as the Knights Templar, properly called, listen to this, because this will ring a bell, the United Religious, Military and Masonic Orders of the Temple of St. John of Jerusalem, Palestine, Rhodes and Malta. Ring a bell. You know, that was the, actually the name that was on the plaque. You know, and so that, for short, is the Knights Temple, Templar, the Order of the Knights Templar. And this appendant body then offers a further three degrees. The degree of the Knights Templar, then above that the degree of Knight of St. Paul, and finally the degree of Knight of Malta. And so right there at the pinnacle, this is a highly, highly influential order, very powerful order, and you can see that the pathways through the order of the Holy Royal Arch right the way up. Membership into this infamous order is by invitation only, I might add, by invitation only. And members are required to sign a declaration stating that they hold, catch this, fully to the Christian doctrine of the Holy Trinity. If you want to be a Knights Templar or a member of that order and its associated degrees, you need to be a professing Christian. I find that quite Amazing. It's almost geared up. And as we go through this, you'll see across the weeks that Mason is actually geared up to snare the Christian. It's in garbed in Christian terminology, garbed in Christian symbolism, you know, and its emphasis is to draw in the Christian. Hence why so many Christians are Freemasons, you know, nominally Christian, I might add. You know, because if we're truly reading our Bible, I don't see how your conscience can allow you to be part of these orders and at the same time profess Christ when you look at what goes on in their rituals. In the United States, it's a slightly different picture because we're hopefully building up a picture that Freemasons is quite disfragmented. You know, it's quite disfragmented. In the United States, once a Mason has completed the first three degrees, which in, in, in American Masonry it's called Blue Lodge, same three degrees, entered apprentice, fellow craft, and master Mason, they then become eligible to pursue Masonry further through two main Masonic appendant bodies. You have the York Rite and the Scottish Rite. Now, the York Rite brings together three primary bodies containing a number of degrees. You'll notice some similarities there in those symbols. The first order or the chapter that a Master Mason joins in the Royal in the York Rite is Royal Arch Masonry. So it's got similarities, the um, York Rite, with English and Wales Freemasonry. I haven't touched on Scotland and Ireland. That's slightly different again, you know, but because of time set, we're focusing on England and Wales. There's some similarities within them, but again, there's some differences that are quite significant. Following successful completion of the rituals and ceremonies associated with each of the degrees within the Royal Arch degree, because in English and Welsh, uh, English Freemasonry, the Royal Arch degree is just one degree, whereas in the York Rite, it's called the Holy Royal Arch degree or chapter, and within that, there's degrees within that. I've forgotten how many now, but I think there's about four or five degrees within that that you move up in, which we don't have in English Freemasonry. Now, following the successful completion of those, you can then move on to the next order, which is Cryptic Masonry. And this order then confers a further three degrees. And the final order joined in the York Rite Masonry, right at the top of that order, is the Knights Templar, which is the same case in England. And it requires those joining to be or to profess the Trinitarian Christian 
faith. We found out quite recently there's quite a few influential Christians. Rick Joyner's one of them, isn't he? Darling, that's a member of the Knights Templar, the Order of the Knights Templar. Now, obviously, we don't advocate Rick Joyner anyway, but I mean, you know, there's some very influential Christian leaders that are part of the Knights Templar because of its Christian attraction. Now, this last order, the Knights Templar, is modelled on the historic Knights Templar, which was a medieval Catholic military order. Incidentally, the Roman Catholic Church forbid their members to be Freemasons. It's absolutely anathema. They cannot be Freemasons. Or, or no doubt there are some, but the official stance is they shouldn't. And this ancient medieval Catholic military order, um, as I said, existed in the Middle Ages. And this Knights Templar, the Masonic Order confers a further three orders which culminates in the Order of the Temple, the Order of the Temple. The orders within York Rite Masonry, as I said, they share similarities with the independent dependent bodies in other countries, including England and Wales, though, as I said, there are differences in organisation and in ritual as well. What's the second route available in America? And I guess this is the one we've all heard of. It's the Scottish Rite, and associated with that it is the crowning 33rd degree, you know, which is by an honorary that actually has 32 degrees. So it picks up where Bluecraft left off and you go through degree four all the way up to degree 32. And at the very pinnacle by, um, as an honorary, there's the 33rd degree. So we often hear a 32nd degree mason, 33rd degree mason, it's the Scottish right. Now, you could be a 33rd degree Freemason in the Scottish Rite and be, you know, right at the top of the order of the Knights Templar in York Rite or English Freemasonry, and one's not better than the other, if you know what I mean. They're just different branches. Some Masons, Master Masons, choose to, choose to pursue both. Some just choose to pursue one route. You know, it's just almost like a, an exploration. You go, you know, where, where you feel... Now, Scottish Rite Masonry is an appendant body, as I said, distinct from the Grand Lodge of that state, and it has its own central authority relative to each country or state called the Supreme Council, and that oversees the ascending degrees of the Scottish Rite. The chief of that group is actually the commanding commander general. He oversees the t at the very top or oversees the whole Supreme Council. Now, in English... Freemasonry in England and Wales, the Scottish Rite is known as the ancient and accepted rite for England. I'm just going to pull this diagram back up so you can see there at the end. That there, it just looks like an insignificant thing, but that is the Scottish Rite equivalent, you know, in England. The ancient and accepted rite. And it, or another word for it is the Rose Croix, and that also requires you to be a Christian if you're in England or Wales. And, you know, obviously you pursue up through the 33 degrees within that, although you don't go up one, two, three, or four, five, six, seven. You sort of take big jumps up, and it's almost the others are covered through the rituals. They don't have individual rituals in England for every single degree, whereas in America they do, and they're all linked. Now, what are some of the attractions to Freemasonry? I'm just going to pull this back up. What are some of the attractions to Freemasonry? Just pull this here. <clears throat> I'll just pull this up. Just a minute. See, it went off. All right. Well, some of the attractions of Freemasonry. Under the heading, what is Freemasonry? The United Grand Lodge of England states the following. Freemasonry means different things to each of those who join. For some, it's about making new friends and acquaintances. For others, it's about being able to help deserving causes, making a contribution to family and society. But for most, it is an enjoyable hobby. An enjoyable hobby. Now, that's an underestimate or an understatement, if ever I heard one. If we were to ask a Mason, what was your reason for joining a lodge, we would invariably get different responses back from them. But according to the United Grand Lodge of England, quote on their homepage, what is Masonry? Freemasonry instills in its members a moral and ethical approach to life. Its values are based on integrity, kindness, Honesty and fairness. 
Members are urged to regard the interests of the family as paramount, but importantly, Freemasonry also teaches concern for people, care for the less fortunate, and help for those in need. Now remember at the beginning when I said, what is Freemasonry? And I said that it invariably for different people means different things. I said for some that think of morally upright standing citizens, those that are good, that give to charity. Where does this come from? Well, we all know that Freemasons have impressed the world with their quote-unquote great charity work. You know, they're you know, very, very aggressive in the area of charity. Especially, I might add, as we're going to see, towards their own members and families in times of need and bereavement. They set up care homes, you know, if you're, if you're a widow, then they'll take care of you. You can have a Masonic funeral or burial service if you're, if you're a Master Mason, etc. According to the Telegraph, Freemasonry is the second largest charitable donor in the UK. I'll say that again. The second largest charitable donor in the UK. In 2010, the United Grand Lodge of England donated more than £82 million to good causes, including Royal College of Surgeons, Help the Hospices, the Red Cross and Air Ambulance. And so it puts up a good front publicly so that obviously the, the negativity can almost be balanced out of what really goes on. Their public face is one of charity, one of help, one of, you know, coming together in brotherly love. And so it's an attraction for many to want to join with a good cause. You know, many join charities for those reasons. Why not join the Freemasons? The Telegraph went on to report, and this is interesting, Freemasons will be denied a multi-million pound tax break after a judge ruled that their governing body was not sufficiently philanthropic to be exempt from VAT. I find that quite interesting. What does that mean? Well, the judge basically ruled that because out of that huge sum that they give, only 25 to 30 percent of all the Grand Lodge's charitable donations go to causes with no Masonic connection. Just 25 to 30 percent of that will go to causes that are not, you know, linked to Masonry. Now, the judge therefore ruled that it did not constitute, therefore, a care for all of humanity, which is what um, philanthropy is all about, you know, helping the world and not just your own. Now, this is what the judge said. To the extent that monies were paid with the hope or expectation of self-insurance, so it was almost like an insurance programme, their payment does not seem to us to be an act of philanthropy. So in other words, it's like a paying scheme. You pay out and you get back out at the end, sort of miss the mark. Judge Hellier also ruled that Freemasons, quote, hope or expectation that grand charity would, sorry, that the grand charity would assist them and their families in times of need meant their donations had an element of self-insurance and personal benefit. Now, Others might choose to join Freemasonry for purely social reasons, purely social reasons, to further their own personal interests, such as friendship, you know, status, some people join, or just to make business connections, you know, in the business world. These are all real reasons why people join. We don't mean to think that everyone going in has got, is some sinister person. They're normally very morally upright, you know, you have to be you know, under quote-unquote the rules, you need to be, you can't have a criminal record in that sense, you know, be a criminal, you know, you have to be an up up, um, law-abiding citizen. And so we have to be careful when we talk to people that are Freemasons that we don't just demonise them and think that there's, there's some Satan worshippers, you know. A lot of them are misled and they're going to it for good causes. For others, though, they are drawn to the mysterious side of masonry, what goes on within those lodges, its symbols, its rituals, its secrets. For those who want to become members, the official line is this, to become one, you start by asking one. You know, to become a mason, you start by asking one. Their motto is knock and it shall be opened. You know, so if you know a mason, you inquire, excuse me, and the door will be opened and you go in that way. 
However, we know in practice, you know, it is by invite. You know, I know that, you know, my dad shared some stories that it is by invite, you know, even though technically that's not the case, although the higher orders most definitely are by invite. Now, would-be candidates must be over 21, must be men of good repute, and catch this, must believe in a supreme being is absolute mandatory. So, quote-unquote, you can't be an atheist Freemason. You know, you might be an undercover atheist, but you can't be an overt atheist and be a Freemason. You must believe in a supreme being. And we'll come to more of that in a minute. I want to talk a little about, about corruption within Freemason. We can't really talk about Freemason without going into this. Um, many powerful and influential people in the world, let's just face it, are Freemasons. You know, that's just a given. Including lawyers, civil servants, bankers, many within the police force and armed services of Freemasons. The potential, therefore, come on, the scriptures tell us that man is inherently corrupt. And though on the surface Freemason would say we're moral, we're abiding, you know, we're law abiding, men are corrupt, men are corrupt. And so the potential for bias among fellow brethren is obviously open to exploitation. Stephen Knight, I've got his book, The Brotherhood, you know, he was a journalist and an author who wrote a book in the late 80s um, entitled The Brotherhood. And in this book, Knight set about investigating the influence of Freemason within life in Britain, which is obviously quite interesting for us. I'm trying to focus this study a lot on our country because the other cults, their headquarters are in, you know, America usually. So we go there to sort of to, to find out what's really going on. Whereas here we're dealing with our own country. Knight found through his investigatory and journalistic work that more than 60% of all police, chief, police chiefs at the time in the UK were Freemasons. You know, more than 60%. Knight's investigation also uncovered that Birmingham City Police in particular, and obviously we're only 21 miles away from there, had a very strong Masonic presence. He's actually got a whole chapter in the book just on Birmingham City Police at the time, speaking about, you know, the corruption that was there. He was a journalist. He's not a Christian. He was a journalist, purely doing journalistic research, interviewing people who, were, who through connections, who were practicing Freemasons, who'd left Freemasonry, and he was piecing all the things together, doing some undercover work. One informant spoke tonight about his experiences dating back many years at the time in Birmingham City Police, and he said the following... In theory, Masons are not supposed to show favour to a man just because he's a Mason, but in practice it doesn't work that way at all. You go to a London lodge where the Met police meet, and the next promotions in every department are discussed. It's the same in Birmingham. You cannot possibly rise in the CID, for instance, in the old Birmingham city area, unless you're in a lodge. That was page 100 of his book. An online article bringing it up to date, 12th of January 2014 in the Belfast Telegraph, this was also run in the Independent as well, it revealed how, quote, Masons are used to corrupt um, justice system. How Masons are used, rather, sorry, to corrupt justice system. Part of the report noted the following. Quote, secret networks of Freemasons have been used by organised crime gangs to corrupt the criminal justice system, according to a bombshell Metropolitan Police report leaked to the Independent. Operation Tiberius, written in 2002, found underworld syndicates used their contacts in the controversial Brotherhood to recruit corrupted officers inside Scotland Yard and concluded it was one of the most difficult aspects of organised crime corruption to prove against, close quote. And that was taken from the Belfast Telegraph. We're not talking about, you know, a, 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 you know, a newspaper that's like the sun. You know, we're talking about a reputable newspaper, you know, the Times. The article also pointed out that Operation Tiberius was the second secret police report revealed in the last six months into such abuses and by no means was it the first. The article goes on to say the following, concerns over the influence of Freemasons on the criminal justice system in 1998 led former Home Secretary Jack Straw to order that all police officers and judges should declare membership of the organisation. 
However, 10 of Britain's 43 police forces refused to take part and the policy was dropped under threat of legal action. What have you got to hide? You know, what have you got to hide? Stephen Knight also reported that a large number of people had also contacted him over their concerns that Freemasons in the judiciary and legal profession also exercised a harmful influence over the administration of justice. He points out that Masonry is very, very powerful among solicitors in England and Wales. There was a great stronghold within solicitor firms. And he said the following on page 153 of his book. The impartiality of Freemason judges has been called into question. There have been claims of huge Masonic conspiracies between rival firms of solicitors and suggestions that Freemasonry is such a grey eminence, that means a person who exercises power behind the scenes, that proceedings in open court are merely outward show. While everything is decided in advance, long before cases involving Masons reach court. Now again, we're not quoting from Christians. We're not quoting from, you know, dubious sources. We're dealing with thorough journalism. You know, this book, The Brotherhood, was actually banned, you know, by the United Grand Lodge of England. Its members were not to read this book, The Brotherhood, late 1980s. Knight also goes on to speak how masonry is rife within the Bank of England, which has its own lodge, as do many teaching hospitals. He also highlighted masonry's heavy presence in the nationalised industries at the time, especially the British Steel Corporation, the National Coal Board, British Rail, the Post Office, along with the Regional Gas and Electric Boards. Now, obviously, you know, my dad shared that, you know, he'd worked for British Rail for over 20 years and shared, you know, with us how some of his own colleagues at the time, masonry was rife within British Rail and there'd be two people going for a job, one person on paper who was better than the other, but everyone knew why the other person got the job. You know, he was a mason. It was just almost a given. You just knew, join the club and you will rise in promotion. So that was first-hand testimony from, you know, my dad's own experience. Now... A man can signal very easily to another that he's a mason if he doesn't belong to the same lodge as him by making use of the various secret grips that happen within rituals. So there's a grip for each of the degrees, you know, the apprentice, the entered apprentice, the fellow craft, the master mason will each have their own grip. And by shaking hands with a man, you know, it's often been said if you feel the strange pressure being applied to your hand, you know, what's that all about? But, you know, the mason to another knows exactly what it's about and Knight goes on to say as a former master mason revealed to him he said quote on page 132 there are three basic handshakes in daily use one for each of the first degrees the entered apprentice applies distinct pressure with his right thumb on the knuckle of the other man's forefinger the fellow craft does the same thing with the second knuckle the master mason applies distinct pressure with his right thumb between the knuckles of the other's middle and third finger. The man, I haven't put it in here, also talked about how there's certain positions that you can put your feet in the sign of a square that can also send signals to someone that you're a fellow mason. Now, this isn't conspiracy theory. This is fact. You know, this is what's going on. This is journalism. You know, what Knight was doing, the sources that we're quoting from, reputable sources. We're not getting them off the internet. Not that the internet's terrible, there's good sources on there, obviously, you know, but I mean, we're not just going to some, you know, guy who's just saying things with no evidence. Now, I want to finish off by asking in the last part of this teaching, what is Freemasonry? Well, the great clarion call of Freemasonry is summed up in this statement. I want to come on to look at the heart of what Freemasonry is. It's summed up in this. Masonry accepts good men who are found to be worthy regardless of their religious convictions and strives to make better men of them by emphasising a firm belief in the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man and the immortality of the soul. That, in a nutshell, is the paper definition of what Freemasonry is. But digging a little deeper, you know, rather than just being men that are worthy, 
regardless of their convictions, striving to make good men better is the often the saying. Obviously, those three key things, the brotherhood of man, or rather the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man, the immortality of the soul. But when we dig a little deeper, one soon learns that Freemasonry is actually much more than just a social club, but rather is one of the oldest. Remember 1717? You know, we're talking, well, actually, they're going to celebrate, I've forgotten the exact technical term, but their 300th anniversary in three years from now. And they're making preparation big time for that watch this space it's one of the oldest fraternal orders in the world now what is a fraternity it's more than a social club i mean we can belong to a golf club and it's not a fraternity what is a fraternity which is really the heartbeat behind the bond and the secrecy that's there you know i would argue that the obviously the brotherhood brings the whole thing into you know hush you know, so that the secret things can go on and that bond of brotherhood keeps us together. Well, a fraternity is a brotherhood, a group of men bound together by a common bond. That's what a brotherhood is. For the Christian, we know that our common bond is Jesus Christ. That's what binds us together. So we can have rich, old, young, poor, whatever background, social class, social status, and we are one because the same spirit of God that dwells me dwells in you. We have unity, we have fellowship based on Jesus Christ. All our allegiance, all our loyalties to our King, Jesus Christ. It's through faith in him, as I've said, we've been born into his family and we've been brought into union with those who also have been made heirs of God's family through faith in Christ. John 1.12 But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name so our family is derived from heaven we're born into it i become a brother to you and we become family that's christianity now i want you to note something god becomes our father as many as received him to them gave he power to become sons so whilst god is the god of the universe and while he's creator of everyone He's not father of everyone. We need to be born into his kingdom. At that point, he becomes our heavenly father. Jesus even rebuked the scribes and Pharisees saying that their father was Satan. For the Mason, however, the bond of brotherhood is not the Lord Jesus Christ, but rather the principles and teachings of Freemasonry. When one becomes a Mason, that man's loyalty and commitment are now to his fellow Masonic brethren. He swears oaths to that effect. You know, Jesus talked about a divided heart, how a man cannot serve two masters. His commitment to his fellow Masonic brethren in the lodge, as the term brotherhood implies. How many brotherhoods are is there? When a candidate is being initiated into the first degree of craft masonry, which is the entered apprentice, listen to the prayer that's prayed. Vouchsafe thine aid, almighty father and supreme governor of the universe, to our present convention, and grant that this candidate for Freemasonry may so dedicate and devote his life to thy service as to become a true and faithful brother among us. Endue him with a, uh, with a competency of thine divine wisdom that, assisted by the secrets of our Masonic art, he may the better be enabled to unfold the beauties of true godliness to the honour and glory of thy holy name. Absolute blasphemy. Absolute blasphemy. I'll go into that, but one has to ask the question, what is the brotherhood of masonry based upon? Present in any lodge can be masons. Remember I said the qualifying thing was to believe in a supreme being. Well, within any one lodge can exist Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, and the list could keep going on and on and on, members of the Baha'i faith doesn't matter but yet at the same time we're still going to pray that same prayer as to become a true and faithful brother among us holy father how can he be their father unless one is born into his family 
We'll come to that more in a minute. Scripture's clear. Brotherhood exists only for those who share the same father by being born again. Yet masonry assures the candidate that he has brotherhood through the fraternity of Freemasonry. One will also note that the prayer includes a petition to God, and listen to this, for him to endure upon the candidate an understanding of his wisdom that through the assistance of the secrets of Masonic art, he will be better enabled to unfold the beauties of true godliness to the honour and glory of God's holy name. Well, hang on a minute. For the Christian, I believe the Bible is inspired. I believe the Bible is the inerrant word of God. If I want to know about godliness, if I want to know about unveiling, unfolding the true beauties of godliness, I don't need the Masonic arts to help me do it. I have the 66 um, books of the, of the Bible, you know, which can do a, a perfectly good job. You know, we come to the scriptures. The Bible is our supreme and final authority for all matters of faith and conduct. And so how possibly could the Christian sit under the hearing of this prayer and almost imply, well, the prayer says quite blatantly that he's going to need now the assistance of the arts of Freemasonry to unfold God's, um, the beauties and of true godliness. Is that an absolute blasphemy? The true born again Christian has all he could possibly need already given to him through the word of God and through the indwelling Holy Spirit which illuminates and reveals to us God. Masonry has no part. The united Grand Lodge, and I mean that point there will be quite important when we deal with next week's is, is masonry a religion? Because quite clearly there we're talking about unfolding the beauties of true godliness masonry somehow in helping one to do that seems like religion to me now the united grand lodge of england further defines masonry as the following a society of men concerned with moral and spiritual values its members are taught its principles which are moral lessons and self-knowledge by a series of ritual dramas a progression of allegorical two-part plays which are learned by heart and performed within each lodge, which follow ancient forms and use stonemasons' customs and tools as allegorical guides taken from their home page. Now what is an allegory? An allegory is a story which on the surface there's a plain meaning. Everyone gets the plain meaning, but to the person with knowledge, he gets the proper meaning of what was really meant by that story it's a little bit like with parables Jesus purposely used them to hide what he wanted from the Pharisees but in private he expounded it to his disciples so they would get the true knowledge of what he really meant by that parable to them it was just talking about fishing and talking about sowing seeds that's an allegory what then is a symbol because masonry majors on allegory majors on symbolism what's a symbol well a symbol's quite simple if you do not have knowledge, you get nothing from it. That's the difference. You get nothing from it. You look at it, get nothing from it. It's just lines, diagrams, points. But to the person with knowledge, he sees that symbol and understands what is meant by it. Now, the origins of masonry are shrouded in mystery and antiquity. Modern day Freemasonry is often referred to as speculative masonry in contrast to operative masonry. Now, the operative masons were simply those working stone masons. There's nothing wrong if you're a mason, you know, and you're a stone mason, you know, you hew out rock, and you're a craftsman, you know, working with stone. But speculative masonry, which is modern day Freemasonry, they believe grew out of these guilds because within operative masonry you had guilds, you know, which would obviously be like unions, etc., and places where they would meet. And over time, um, prof other professionals were admitted into these guilds, you know, um, and they brought with that um, their ancient occultic philosophies and mysteries, and hence it began to snowball from there into modern masonry. Now, we therefore see that the tools of the operative masons, such as the square and compass, you know, these are actual literal tools, and much of masonry in the craft degrees is just blatant um, stone masons' tools, you know, which have a hidden meaning, which have been taken from its natural meaning, and to those with knowledge, truths are taught through the symbols. 
The square and compass is the most famous. It's really the emblem of Freemasonry. And as I said, it teaches moral, it teaches spiritual lessons through these symbols. It's said that the square and, um, symbolizes morality and the compass symbolizes spirit, spirituality. One person's put it that the square um, signifies the human side and the compass symbolizes the divine as you move up the higher ranks. We'll see, at, especially within Scottish Rite Freemasons, and we'll, we'll come on to that, it's quite significant. I'm gonna read this quote, it's taken from H.L. Hayward, symbol, Symbolic Masonry. It's quoted from a source online. It says, the position, and this is a very influential book, I think it was around the early 1900s, this book was written. The position of the square and compass in the three degrees is representative of the struggle between the mundane and divine in every person. So he spills it out right there. When a man is initiated in the entered apprentice degree, he is a natural man with his earthly nature dominating or covering the spiritual the representation of this in the entered apprentice is the square supported by the compass. In the fellow craft degree, the brother is halfway to achieving spirituality, so only one point of the compass is elevated above the square. In the master mason degree, spirituality has conquered the mundane in the man. This is represented in the degree by having both points of the compass elevated above the square. So in other words, he's mastered the base side of of the flesh and he's now striving you know to 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 allow the divine you know within him to rule and to conquer albert pike talked about the equi equilibrium you know trying to get this balance and the top secret at the end of the 32 degrees is that basically the realization that you know we have a divine within us and we must suppress that and so on it's all mystic um mysticism you know an occultic in nature. We'll come on to this as we move along in the future teachings. Moving along, as one passes into each degree within masonry, one has to take part in a ritual enactment at each of the degrees. And this really is the strength of masonry, it's ritual. No ritual, no Freemasonry, full stop, full stop, that's it. You know, the whole heartbeat of Freemasonry is its ritual. The symbols and everything else revolves around that. It's ritual, it's ceremony, it's whole, you know, um, focus upon this whole um, allegory plays being played out, role plays being played out, secret oaths being sworn, secret hands. It's a whole ritual that's secretive. I mean, you even get the ritual books and it's in code. So they'll have like vowels missing out here and, word, and letters missing out here. So it needs to be deciphered. Now, there's people obviously within masonry who were worshipful masters who've deciphered them, and we can read what they are. You know, it's quite clear. But why doesn't it allow these rituals to be public? And therefore, it will always has to be considered a secret society. Now, the first three degrees um, of craft masonry, these allegorical plays, which, as I said, they involve lectures. They involve scripted words, they need to learn the lines, you know, and it's almost like a role play being played out between the initiate and the, and the grand master of the lodge, or rather the worshipful master and the others within the lodge. Now, in the first three degrees of craft masonry, these allegories are centred on the building of Solomon's temple and the legend of the chief architect Hiram Abiff. Hiram is in the Bible, you know, he was one of the, the, the master builders of the temple, you know, on when Solomon built his temple, but they take this and build a legend out of it of Hiram Abiff. The rituals also involve the swearing of oaths, as I said, secret passwords, signs, handshakes, and throughout these rituals, symbols are interwoven, which like an onion has multiple layers of meaning. John Ankerberg put it like this in his book, The Secret Teachings of the Masonic Lodge. He said the following, at one level of initiation, a symbol may mean one thing. At a higher level of initiation, it may mean something else entirely. In the beginning, most Masonic symbols have certain more or less universally accepted meanings. But in the end, after a Mason is enlightened, each symbol can mean virtually anything a Mason wants it to be or wants it to mean, close quote. And that's what was pointed out in his book. 
As one proceeds through the degrees of Freemasonry, one is gradually, and this is important, gradually indoctrinated into its higher truths. It moves away from just being as I said, a, a good old boys club, a charity work, you know, a bit where you scratch my back, business dealings. It moves away from that highly into the spiritual as you move up, up to the higher echelons of the higher orders, without a doubt. And Albert Pike, a 33rd degree Mason, one of the probably the most well-known, you know, among certain circles, especially the Scottish Rite, because he was the sovereign grand commander of the Scottish Rite, in the 1800s, and he wrote a book, Morals and Dogma. On page 819, he says the following, The blue degrees are but the outer court of portico, or portico of the temple. Part of the symbols are displayed there to the initiate, but he is intentionally misled by false interpretations. It is not intended that he shall understand them, but it is intended that he shall imagine he understands them. Remember what we were talking about? Their true explication is reserved for the adepts, the princes of masonry in the high degrees, close quote. For the Christian taking part in such rituals, the question must be asked quite simply. And I mean, Knight documents in his book many Christians whose consciences bothered them. They went through these rituals and within them, there was almost a tying because they knew something's not right. They shouldn't be doing these things. They shouldn't be swearing these oaths and saying this mumbo jumbo stuff that really means something, even though they might not know what it means. It means something, it's ritual. And for the Christian, what business has he got doing that? What business has he got partaking in any rituals other than those that are inherently Christian? We partake in communion, we have baptism, we have marriage. These are honourable rituals. They're honourable rituals. What is a ritual? Well, the Oxford Dictionary defines it as a religious or solemn ceremony consisting of a series of actions performed according to a prescribed order. Marriage being such one. A solemn ceremony religious ceremony. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear the language of ritual, it invariably requires the invoking of a supernatural being. At marriage, we invoke God and swear oaths before him that for better or for worse. In baptism, we invoke God. In communion, we invoke God. Well, for Freemasonry, it's no different, except when we partake in ours, we invoke the Holy God of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We invoke the God of Scripture, but for the Freemasons, they invoke, whether knowingly or not, they invoke their own particular deity called the Great Grand, or the Grand, the Great Architect, sorry, of the universe, G A O T U, or they would say the Supreme or the Grand Architect of the universe. And I want to just draw your attention quickly back to the prayer that was said at the end of the apprentice ritual when you were first going into your first degree within masonry and these rituals i've actually took from online but they're from an actual english ritual book which i was so pleased about because obviously different jurisdictions slightly different rituals but we've got the rituals that are undertaken in england and wales and we're going to look into some of those as we go along in the later weeks. Remember the prayer, vouchsafe thine aid, almighty father and supreme governor of the universe to present convention and grant that this candidate from Freemasonry may so dedicate and devote his life to thy service as to become a true and faithful brother among us. Remember when I said that, and we've nearly finished. Well, as I said, Freemasonry is absolutely impartial. When they say Almighty Father and Supreme Governor of the Universe, the Hindu will pray that prayer, or rather that prayer will be said in the hearing of the Hindu. That prayer will be said in the hearing of the Buddha, Buddhist. That prayer will be said in the hearing of any man of any religion. And it's a prayer invoking the great or the grand or the supreme architect of the universe. As I said, within a lodge we find all faiths, Muslim, Hindu, Christian, Buddhist. Freemasonry is absolutely universal to the core. I want to stress that. 
upon the degrees, upon the oaths they're made to swear upon something called the volume of sacred law. Now for the Christian in most Freemason lodges within England, if it's Christian lodge, they will have a Bible. If it's Jewish, they will have a Torah. You know, if it's um, Muslims, they will have a Quran. They will swear, each of them, on what they consider to be their holy book, but they will address the great architect of the universe. It's absolutely universal to the core, ecumenical through and through. It says that God is the universal father of all mankind, regardless of their individual religious beliefs. Hence, remember, the fatherhood of God, of whoever, the brotherhood of man and the immortality of the spirit. Want to read this powerful quote? We're going to look at a couple of scriptures and then we're finished. Christopher Hafner, he was a professing Christian, a Freemason, and he makes the following powerful point. I stumbled on this quote, and it's really, really powerful. And I was just looking actually on Wikipedia. And it's out of his book, as I said, and it really serves to show the nature of Freemason when it comes to religious universalism. Listen to this. Now imagine me standing in the lodge with my head bowed in prayer between Brother Muhammad Bakari and Brother Arjun Malwani. To neither of them is the great architect of the universe perceived as the Holy Trinity. To Brother Bakari, he has been revealed as Allah. To Brother Malwani, he is probably perceived as Vishnu. Since I believe that there is only one God, I am confronted with three possibilities. They are praying to the devil whilst I am praying to God. They are praying to nothing as their gods do not exist. They are praying to the same God as I, yet their understanding of his nature is partly incomplete as indeed is mine. And he quotes 1 Corinthians 13, 12, you know, which says uh, about um, when the perfect has come, you know, not being perfect in knowledge, out of context. It is without hesitation that I accept the third possibility. It is without hesitation. What was the third possibility? We're praying to the same God. Pure universalism. Freemasons, God absorbs all religions into himself. And that is Freemasonry. It takes from everything. Egypt, Greece, Rome, Christianity. It plucks from wherever it likes and mushes it together into this fraternal or, or, um, organism. Well, I'm sorry, the canopy God of Freemasonry is not the God of the Bible. Which choice did Paul say? Paul said, I'll take choice one. They're praying to the devil. He says so in 1 Corinthians 10, 20, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. You know, Christopher takes a third choice, Paul takes the first. Simple as that, they're praying to devils. Now the Bible is quite clear, God confronts the false gods of the heathen nations. How dare we say that Baal is comparable to God, that Allah is comparable to God? Names mean nothing, put something inside the box and we'll begin to find out what that God is really like when that God says such as Allah that God has no son and Jesus did not die on the cross and Muhammad is his prophet then I'm sorry and denies the Trinity denies that Jesus is the son of God then obviously they can't be saying the same God the God of the Bible loves Israel the God of the Quran hates Israel and so we say well God means the same thing by definition as we explore its usage it's not a different God God confronted the pagan gods and said in Isaiah 41 in verses 21 through to 24, Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, saith the king of Jacob. Let them bring them forth and show us what shall happen. Let them show the former things what they be, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them, or declare us things for to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that ye are gods. Ye um, yea, do good or do evil that we may be dismayed and behold it together. 
Behold, ye are of nothing, and your work of naught, an abomination is he that chooseth you. So how can the Christian mason stand in a lodge with brothers of other faiths, quote-unquote brothers within the lodge, and go through these things? You know, it's, if anything, denying the God of the Scriptures, who says he's not the father of Bakri. I've forgotten his name exactly. That he's not the father of Brother Melwani, and he's not the father of Brother Bakri. He's the father of the Christian. Quite clear. The God of Israel declares his uniqueness. He declares in Isaiah 44, 6 and 8, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and the last, and beside me there is no God. And who as I shall call and shall declare it and set it in order for me since I appointed the ancient people? You know, who should I call? And the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there any uh, is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. Amen. In closing this first part of the teaching on Mason, we've seen already very early on fundamental problems and inherent, inherent incompatibility with true biblical Christianity. How can the secret arts of Freemasonry possibly assist the Christian to unfold the beauties of true godliness when he has all the light he could ever desire in Christ and his word? How can there, um, for the Christian, be a brotherhood outside the brotherhood of Christ and with those who worship foreign gods? Well, next week we're going to continue to explore the question, is masonry compatible with Christianity? We'll take a look at the secret oaths that they swear at, especially the first three degrees. We'll also look at the religious nature of Freemasonry and look a little bit more into its history. But we will get more into the rituals because that really is where it's at. You know, we'll actually watch a ritual enactment, you know, um, which someone's done. And so I give God thanks and praise. Let us just pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for the teaching tonight. I thank you for your help. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your strength. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us, please, to retain what we've heard tonight. Help us, Lord, to be in a position to help reach out to those that are ensnared, Father, in Freemasonry. Help us to see, Lord, its universalism. Help us to see, Father, its... It's just a cult nature, and a cult simply means hidden, hidden behind symbols and allegory, through orders and ceremony and ritual. We know that, Father, no honest Christian has part in this darkness. I pray, God, have mercy. Have mercy, and I pray you trouble the consciences of your true people that have gone into this fraternal order, and they do not know what they're getting involved in. I pray you would open their eyes and snatch them out, Lord, and bring them to their senses as you have for many, that they might renounce the lodge and pledge their allegiance wholly to Jesus Christ and to his church. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.